Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the last session for Thursday. Also, welcome to the 2024 Ni National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment Session 301, Aging and HIV 301, People with HIV 55 plus, although we have some people who are younger, clinical differences and discussions on navigating the aging process. My name is Commander Kathleen Davis, and I am the Senior Policy Advisor for the Division of State HIV AIDS Programs within HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau. I will be your moderator today. So I am going to tell you a little bit about our speakers. Nicole Viviano is, current, is a current statistician in the Division of Policy and Data at HRSA HAB, where she first joined as an ORISE Fellow in 2022. As a gerontologist, she has been in the HIV and aging world for six years. She is the co-lead analyst and the, on the AETC uh, report and the lead analyst in the Ending the HIV Epidemic report. She also works between branches to com complete mixed methods data analysis. And she and I are the co-chairs of the HAB HIV and Aging Work Group. So our first speaker will be Dr. Debbie Hagens from the Chatham County Board of Health. Dr. Hagens is a seasoned HIV specialist who is honored to be caring for people living with HIV across the spectrum of ages. She is an in the trenches, frontline healthcare professional offering HIV and primary care services in Southeast Georgia for the past 30 plus years. She works under Ryan, White's, Ryan White's parts B, C, and D. And then we'll be joined by an amazing panel of speakers. Uh, first panelist is Richard Atkins, Richard from NMAC. Richard Atkins is an accountant, activist, and lifetime survivor based in the Washington, D.C. area. Since he was a teen, Richard has served as a support group facilitator, camp counselor, and community advisory board member with a focus on empowering those living with HIV to not just survive, but to thrive. He has worked to educate the community through workshops, artworks, toolkits, and panel discussions. Nasayadet Katai is with HRSA HAB. Nasayadet is a public health analyst at HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, specializing in complex program analysis for HIV AIDS public health initiatives. With a focus on policy advocacy, she has significantly contributed to enhancing HIV treatment and care across both in the United States and internationally. Her notable roles include human rights advisor at WHO, WHO, um, senior advisor for PMTCT at UNICEF, and HIV AIDS advisor, Africa in UNFPA. Nasedet holds an MPH from the University of Minnesota. And PJ Goldman from the Greater Baltimore HIV Services Planning Council. I have to turn the page and my nails are getting stuck. Hold on a second. He is a consumer with 40 years of lived experience, experience and it has a vast a, a knowledge and ability to interact with diverse populations. He currently serves as the chair of the Greater Baltimore HIV, HIV Health Services Planning Council. And it is now my pleasure um, to turn this over to Nicole Viviano. everyone. Uh, like Kat said, we're, we're so excited to have you here. Um, we know that it's 4.30, but we're hoping that you have a little jazz in your left. Um, <laughs> so just bear with me as I go through some of the more housekeeping slides and that we can get this party started, okay? Okay, so I know you all have seen this, but just as a review, uh, HRSA supports more than 90 programs that provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically challenged, and HRSA does this through grants and cooperative agreements to more than 3,000 awardees, um, including community and faith-based organizations, colleges, universities, hospitals, state, local and tribal governments, and private entities. And every year, 
oh, sorry. <laughs> Every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people, including people with HIV, uh, pregnant people, mothers and their families, and those otherwise unable to access uh, quality health care. And again, another slide that you've probably seen, but given the rapid changes in healthcare in the ending the HIV epidemic in the United States initiative, along with our efforts to support the national HIV AIDS strategy, we refreshed HAB's vision and mission. And so we don't wanna go too far into this, but we do want to emphasize and underscore that we wouldn't be able to do um, any of this or achieve our vision and mission without the support of all of you who are carrying out this important work every day. So the Ryan White HIV and AIDS program provides a comprehensive system of HIV primary medical care, medications, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. It funds grants to states, cities, counties, and local community-based organizations to improve health outcomes and reduce HIV transmission. Um, it provided services to over 566,000 people in 2022, which is more than half of all people diagnosed with HIV in the United States. And say it with me, 89.6% of clients receiving HIV medical care were virally suppressed in 2022, exceeding the national average of 65.9%. Um, so as you can see, we're going to go a little bit over the numbers from 2022 uh, regarding the uh, Ryan White HIV and AIDS program. And like Kat said, I am a statistician, so this is my bread and butter, which I love. But um, as you can see, some of the characteristics of the clients served in 2022 in this slide. So for the most part, these numbers have been quite consistent since 2010. Approximately 75% were racial or ethnic minorities. Approximately 60% were living at or below the federal poverty level. Close to 50% of clients were ages 50 years of age or older in 2022, and the proportion of clients aged 50 or older has been increasing steadily over time. And nearly 7% had temporary housing, and five, over 5% had unstable housing. Um, and as previously mentioned, we have that 89.6% of Ryan White clients that received HIV medical care reached viral suppression in 2022. So approximately 48% of clients were 50 years of age and older in 2022. And like we just said, the proportion of aging clients in, um, in the Ryan White program um, has been increasing steadily over the years. And so in this bar chart right here, we can see some of the shifts in the age distribution of Ryan White clients from 2010 to 2022. So to very quickly orient you to uh, the bar chart, on the uh, right hand side, the hashed gray bars are the 2010 percentages, and then the orange red bars are the 2022 percentages of um, people in each age group. And this chart shows um, age groups, of, and the older age groups, the uh, 55 to 64 and the 65 plus, are farther on the right hand side. Um, and we can see that. Uh, the actual percentage points increased um, by 20.1% in uh, those age groups from 2010 to 2022. Community engagement and the Ryan White um, program is very, very integral, and it's already a part of our um, existing fabric of the Ryan White program. So Ryan White recipients funded through Part A, B, C, D, and the EHE initiative are encouraged and or required to support activities that facilitate collaboration with community members, work with their communities and public health partners to improve health, health outcomes across the HIV care continuum. And in addition, community engagement is a key element of the Ryan White Part A and Part B planning councils and, plan and planning bodies, integrated planning efforts, and clinical quality management activities. Uh, to continue, HRSA's Ryan White program continues to invest in the program supporting community engagement and building leadership among people with lived experience. So this includes building leaders of color 2.0, elevate for all people with HIV, escalate ending stigma through, collaboration and lifting all to empowerment, EHE Systems Coordinating uh, Provider, or SCP, and EHE Technical Assistance Provider, or TAP. So further, HRSA's Ryan White program uh, aims to emphasize and empower populations and topics like older adults, long-term survivors, life-term survivors, 
um, long-term care services and system coordination, including medication uh, coverage, transition to Medicare and or Medicaid coverage, aging-related and preventative screening, and quality of life through the development of our new uh, work, work group on older adults, long-term and life-term survivors, because these populations are incredibly important to us and they need to be prioritized. Additionally, this work group works and will continue to work with other federal partners who play critical roles in the betterment of these populations. So thank you so much for this entertaining me with this very brief introduction. Um, but now I will proudly turn it over to Dr. Uh, Debbie Haggins. That's my age showing. Great afternoon. And I am thrilled and excited to be here as a part of this wonderful conference and to be a part of this meaningful and necessary conversation. The slide on HIV and aging, oh, I do it. Never mind. I'm good, I'm good. All right. So I have the honor and the privilege of aging along with many of the clients. I have been doing HIV care since 1989. So I have no disclosures, and I'm going to keep this short and sweet. So I'm going to have to move quickly, and I'm going to oversimplify aging. This is not a clinical presentation, but to understand the intersection of HIV and its impact on aging, to talk a little bit about life expectancy and what are some of the major influences of life expectancy and also for us to better appreciate and applaud the progress that we have made on HIV treatment and um, longevity. So simply aging is getting older and my dad used to say if somebody complained about getting old he said well the alternative is to die young. And even though I have put on this slide that aging starts at birth, and it, it does, and I'm thinking about the pictures that I took of my granddaughter when she was one hour old, three hours old, two days old, a week old. But for the purposes of this talk, aging really begins with adulthood, when we have already fully developed and we have reached what we would consider our peak years of physical endurance, performance, agility, and you think about what we just witnessed at the Olympics. And even though those are athletes, at some point in their life, they're gonna to begin to experience decline. We think about aging in terms of decades, your 20s, your 50s, your octanarian, a septenarian. So I'm gonna talk about it in that vein as well. And when we talk about aging, it is very complex intersection of internal factors, external factors, genetics, hormones, and the like. So we age at the cellular level. Our bodies are comprised of trillions of cells that have differentiated into different tissues and organs. We got brain cells, heart cells, bone cells, kidney cells, liver cells, you get the picture. So when we age, our cells divide and divide and divide. And at some point, they begin to show the evidence of aging. We see it with our skin. It's no longer as firm and elastic, and we have some sagging and lines and wrinkles. Um, I think about, of course, a rubber band that keeps losing its elasticity, excuse me, but also about a rechargeable battery. Uh, if you have the little app on your phone, it would tell you your battery life. And of course, over time, the battery can no longer charge to 100% because you've charged it over and over and over. And I have an electric car, okay? It no longer gets the distance that it used to get at 100% because now it's a little over three years old. So there are many factors that go into aging as we begin to decline by decades of life. I put on here about HIV, um, turns on the immune system, and the immune system is always on. Our immune system was designed to turn off and on. When the body has recognized an invading organism, it turns itself on to eradicate that infection. Well, with HIV, because it is a chronic inflammatory condition, because without medication, of course, it's going to rebound, but the viral load in the body is never fully zero. 
So think about a light bulb that stays on all the time. And I remember my dad saying, turn that light off, turn that light off. When you leave the room, turn that light off, <laughs> okay? Well, a bulb that stays on all the time is eventually going to burn out. And it's going to burn out faster than a bulb that's being used intermittently. And then sometimes we have appreciated the fact that the antiretroviral regimen that we use historically also may have contributed to accelerated aging by contributing to an accelerated cell death. Life expectancy. I mean, simply life expectancy is our lifespan, and it's an estimate of the average number of remaining years at any given point. Now, that being said, what are some of those influences? Well, how long can a person live after they've been diagnosed with HIV? It's too simple a word. It depends. It depends on a lot of things. And among us today are people who have been living with HIV who beat the odds for decades. And when we think about the predictors of life expectancy, we talk about the impact that HIV has had on uh, the human body and, of course, the quality and the quantity of life. So when HIV was first identified in the 1980s, 1981, I was in college. And when I was in medical school in 1987, I was in my third year of medical school, life expectancy was very, 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 very short. When a person presented with HIV infection or AIDS, they lived days to months to weeks, and some of them may have lived a little bit longer. So now we fast forward, and it has been estimated that a person who was infected at the age of 20 can now live a near normal lifespan, and they can live 70 plus years. So uh, I was looking at our record to see how old were some of our oldest divas in our clinic, uh, and they're in their 80s, going on 86, 87. Uh, not that they had been infected for a very long time, but still that quality and that quantity of life. So I want to just pause and talk about how did we at least be having an impact on longevity and life expectancy with HIV. And of course, 1987, I was in my third year of medical school, and HIV was still uh, a frightening disease. Uh, people were dying. They were coming in uh, with all kind of age-defining illnesses. And then in 1995, 1996, when we had the birth of protease inhibitors, we had heart was born, and people were coming out of uh, hospice houses, and people were, you know, throwing away their canes. People were now going to have some improvement in the hope, all right, that they would live longer. And now that we have the advances that we have now, people certainly have a reduced pill burden, and not only has the quantity of life been extended, the quality of that life has also extended. I have had the privilege of being some of my uh, patients' biggest cheerleaders, all right, about what do you want to do with your life. Now, we're talking about what influences our life expectancy, what influences aging, um, and I think that some of these might be a little bit controversial. We cannot change the race that we were born in, and we cannot change our genetics. And as I was looking at this slide about gender, I'm talking about chromosomal gender, all right, XX and XY, uh, whatever you were assigned at birth. So I'm not talking about gender identity and how people change themselves, and yes, we can change our outward appearances. And then the physiologic impact of HIV, that's a yes and a no. Okay, yes, we can slow down the process. We can kind of slow down that immune system being on all the time. But uh, in some aspects, we cannot until we can eradicate HIV from the body. Well, what can we do? We can do more things than we can't change. We can certainly enhance our understanding by research, by collaboration, by discussions. We can also talk about lifestyle changes, all right, healthy outcomes, being in good and meaningful relationships. And one of the things I was thinking about about life expectancy, I listened to, you know, Ryan White's mother talk about he was going to live for six months, three months, of course, he lived for five more years. But think about the people who beat the odds. But you know what I thought? I said, AI can't even predict, all right, how long somebody might live because they can't measure the human spirit. They can't measure hope and optimism. They can't measure how we rally around people and what that impact does to motivate us. They can't manage, they can't even measure or predict, you know, the human spirit. So yes, we have a lot of things that cause us to extend our life and to give that quality to that life. So 
Um, so what happens when a person finds out that they have HIV? It depends on a lot of things as well. The age that they are, who's with them, where they are in the stage of life, how long am I going to live, you know, how did this happen to me? So we have to meet them where, where they are. But we need to have these conversations over time, of course. And because I have been HIV treated for more than three decades, and I'm still having conversations with patients, I'm still learning things from my patients. They're teaching me the same way I'm teaching them. And every once in a while, I have to remind them that I'm the doctor in the room, OK, and, uh, and, and not you, <laughs> OK? Um, but I sometimes swap seats with them, and I let them sit up, uh, and with the stethoscope, and I sit like, I, and I'm just taking kind of notes on what they're talking to me about. So we talk about all of these things. And of course, there are many, 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 many questions. But I think that when you see this, it resonates. Do I have a future? Can I get married? Can I have a children? Can I have a career? Uh, and they always ask the question. I don't, let me see, is it up there? Yes. Is there a cure? How far are we from the cure? Where is the cure? Where are we in that process? And I like to have those conversations with them. Okay, my watch is buzzing, so I know that's at 10 minutes. All right, so helpful tips. All right, it helps us just to make certain that a client is using one pharmacy, and that's not always the case. And if you're using more than one pharmacy, I like to make sure that the pharmacist who is filling the HIV medication is aware of all the other drugs, just to put it on the list. And then find a pharmacy that uses a pharmacist who has HIV expertise. I love it when a pharmacist calls me to question a regimen that I have put a patient on. And because I'm old school, uh, I might get very creative and put some regimens together for people who are very treatment experienced, who can't tolerate A, Y, and B. I mean, this everything. And I said to them, this is the art of what I do. And then to bring all your medications with you. That is always very, very helpful to us as clinicians. And I'm very privileged to have two of my colleagues sitting right here, my Part D and Part C providers. So thank you. And I did it. I did it. Okay. So I believe now we're going to come to our panelists because that was the bulk of this conversation. And when I talk a little bit about HIV and injury, I think about how uh, when we are injured, you know how um, you might get arthritis in one joint but not the other joint. So the people who've suffered injury doing all that gymnastics, all that football playing, yeah, something might happen to them two and three decades down the road. And somehow HIV has caused injury all right, to the body, and because it's systemic, that injury can occur anywhere. I'm gonna be here after questions, if you have any questions, but thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so we are going to have all of our panelists go ahead and get on the platform. So just as a reminder, we have, uh, we have PJ, we have Richard, and we have Nicia Dett. And I am going to steal the slide advancer. Maybe we'll just do it for me. Oh, actually, Kat, could you hand me my notebook, please? The one right there. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Thank you. OK. So, um, yes, yeah. so again, we have Nice Adep, we have Richard, and we have PJ here with us. And Kat did a wonderful job of introducing them, so I won't read that for you. But we are going to have a chance for them to answer about five questions. Um, and then towards the end, if we have a chance, we will do some Q&A. Um, but we are going to give them a chance to, to speak upon their, their lived experience here. So the very first question, and I'll pose it first to Richard, is can you speak about the experience of living with HIV? Testing, testing. There we, yeah, go. there we go. All right. So before I begin, I want to address the elephant in the room that as a 33-year-old, like, who am I to talk about aging? But <laughs> as a lifetime survivor, that has meant that I have been aging with HIV for 33 years. Um, my family didn't find out about my diagnosis until the uh, until I was five, when my mom was about to deliver my baby sister, it was discovered that my mom was HIV positive. And because she has other children, they recommend that we get tested. So me, my older sister, our fathers were all tested, and I was the only test that came back positive. That um, 
nobody else was positive and thankfully my baby sister ended up being negative. Um, immediately overnight I was put on medication and I'm like, why am I taking these pills all of a sudden? I feel fine. You're telling me I'm sick. I don't, I don't understand. Like when you're sick, you're coughing, your leg hurts, but I was experiencing none of that. And so I kept asking why. And then eventually the questions turned from why am I taking medicine to what happens if I don't? So at that point I was, I saw a therapist who explained to me that reading from a picture book that I have a virus living inside my body and it's important that I take my medicine every day to prevent the virus from getting stronger. But also most importantly is that I don't tell anyone otherwise they may treat me bad or different. And so as a kid you don't understand that you're like why would people treat you bad if you're sick? Don't they bring you chicken noodle soup and tell you to feel better? Um, it wasn't until I was staying over a family member's house when I fell and scraped my knee and immediately I was rushed to the bathroom. They put on masks, put on gloves, kept their distance while they administered a Band-Aid for a scrape that was barely even visible. And that's when it hit me that I'm dangerous, that if this is my own family treating me like this, then how is somebody who I don't know gonna treat me? And it wasn't just me dealing with my own diagnosis. I was also dealing with a parent who um, was living with HIV. And they were told that we wouldn't live to see the year 2000. And so the thought that my mom experienced was who's gonna, who's gonna be buried first, her or me? And this drove her to addiction. Um, this led to homelessness. This led to me being out of school for two years, whereas at that point I still didn't understand what HIV was, but I knew what stigma was well, um, pretty well. That even though things got better, the medications that I had to take were a daily reminder that I'm less than, that I will never find someone who would accept me and just living through depression that physically I was, the medicines were working, I was handling the HIV well, but as I made it through my teens, a lot of depression. And um, the turnaround was when about 17 or 18, and I got to participate in support groups and um, camps and the support groups that was the first time that I was in a room with people who also got the perinatal HIV experience that they saw themselves as bad or different and I didn't see that I thought they were just the same as any other person um, in the room and it slowly clicked for me that okay if they're normal then I'm normal too and with the camps, we, you think of like, what's the impact of a camp? Um, a three day, week long camp, but those camps were the first time in my life where I felt my HIV status didn't matter. One weekend made all the difference in that I got to discover who I am. I felt that HIV impacted so much in my life that I wonder who would I be without it with those camps I got to figure that out and without that experience I don't think I would be here today to tell you about my story thank you thank you so much Richard thank you um, PJ I will ask the same question to you can you speak about the experience of living with HIV sure in 1981 I was working at a lab assistant in the gay community center of Baltimore working with men who had just tested positive for STDs. Little did I know that a few years later I would test positive for HIV. I was devastated. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to turn. I had a ton of questions and no one there to answer them for me. In 1993, Seven years later, I came down with PCP pneumonia. I was admitted to the hospital immediately and treated with IV Bactrim for about a week. It worked. 
good antifungal medication. HIV medication was not readily available when I first tested positive, but it was in 93. And I was released with instructions to take AZT, one of the first medications that was made for HIV. It was the only treatment of HIV at the time, and I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't have stomach distress. I had no side effects of any kind. And I just took the medication religiously, as indicated, until I was prescribed DDI, which was the second medication to come out for HIV. That was a lot of drinking of fluids. As people who have taken DDI know, it, it's just an incredible amount of fluid. After that came DDC, or HIVID. That was the third medication. The fourth medication was D4T. They didn't know at the time, but my CD4 count dropped by half because it interacted with the ACT. They didn't know that until they came out with a clinical study that showed that that was, in fact, the case. I was immediately taken off of D4T and started back on AZT. <clears throat> and the DDI. My mental health declined. I became depressed. I became listless. I didn't know what to do with my life. I wandered from one worst case scenario to another. In 1995, a new protease inhibitor came out, sequinavir. It was the first. My doctor prescribed it for me. It was okay. I didn't have any difficulties with that either. But in 1996, a short time later, there was news about a new drug called Crixivan. Crixivan was the first successful protease inhibitor for treating people with HIV. It changed my life, literally. I became a Lazarus person. I went from almost being on death's bed to being able to get up, move about actively. I applied for disability at the time. I got the disability due to my underlying condition, and I went about shopping because I figured if I was going to be around for a short period of time, I was going to enjoy myself. So I spent lavishly on stereo, television, the latest movies, etc., <laughs> and I enjoyed my life for a great period of time. I fired my first doctor because he refused to switch me off of sequinavir. I consulted with a second doctor who was referred to me by my case manager, and he suggested that I start on, on Crixivan immediately. So that's what I did. I haven't looked back since. I must say that were it not for the Ryan White program, I wouldn't be here today. I am celebrating 40 years of thriving with HIV, all because of the Ryan White program, all because of the doctor who had the audacity and the gall to refuse to put me on sequinavir and the one that did put me on Crixivan. I am still here today. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. Can I see that? You ready? Thank you, and good afternoon. I have learned to cope with HIV by taking it lightly, and so you will probably note my presentation will be sort of on that note, or rather my response. And so I start by saying that ignorance is bliss, is what comes to mind when I think about my experience living with HIV. And I know that sounds like a, an oxymoron, because I've been advocating um, and empowering people with HIV for the last 30 years. Three months after my daughter was born, at a time she was still breastfeeding, I was diagnosed with HIV. That's in 1987. And I'm grateful she's HIV negative. Listening to the powerful panelists share their moving experiences yesterday, I was reminded of what I went through at their age. And I just want to say that you've, you've probably noticed that I'm reading, and maybe my colleague here, PJ, is reading. There's something called foggy brain when you, stay, when you live with HIV for too long. I know Dr. Higgins didn't mention it, but 
I'm letting you know. So <laughs> remembering things becomes a little bit of a problem. Anyway, so this panelist really, really um, reminded me of what HIV was um, in those days. Um, the profound loss of my late husband, my children's father, on December 1, 1990. This symbolic day is one that I'll never forget. I can't forget. World AIDS Day comes every year, so I'm always reminded. And um, it's symbolic because I was holding his hand and crying as he took his last breath. And I bought my burial plot next to his, knowing that I would soon follow. After all, there was no treatment at that time, but I'm still here. Since, <laughs> Since his death, I've seen so many deaths of family members, friends, and colleagues experience stigma and hate, watch my children get stigmatized and mistreated at the age of six and eight years old because I was HIV, and I've experienced so much hurt that I reached a point where I just didn't want to hear anything about HIV AIDS. I was exhausted, I was burnt out. I needed a break from this disease. There had to be more than l in life than just this HIV. And so for about 10 years, I just wanted to be normal and live in blissful s ignorance, just for a little bit. Little did I know that I was aging with HIV and changes, changes that I was blissfully ignorant of were taking place in my body. I felt fine, took my HIV medication, tried to keep active, enjoyed the foods that today I dare not indulge in, but for a treat every so often. Cholesterol was building up. I was pre-diabetic. I was experiencing osteopenia. And this animal called menopause was knocking at the door. I had no idea that, I, that as I aged with HIV, these conditions were occurring earlier than, than, than other women who were not HIV. And what was super frustrating was that my providers had never discussed these with me except to order um, a change in my medication or ask me whether I was sexually active. That's about the exchange. Never did I ever hear anything to do with menopause. Now, I have HPV. I'm sure like probably so many others who are living with HIV which over time has led to abnormal cell growth in my cervix. And these abnormal cells led to yearly colposcopies until all that was left of my cervix was just a scarred tissue. My provider could no longer do a colposcopy, and of course that's necessary to make sure I am not developing, uh, I will not develop cancer, or at least to, be, to catch the cervical cancer early. So because um, my provider could no longer do colposcopy. The only way it could be done was under general anesthesia. And um, <coughs> I soon found out that Medicaid was not going to pay for a colposcopy under anes general anesthesia. But they would pay for hysterectomy. Yep. And so I had a hysterectomy done. With my uterus gone, I thought, ah, my worries of cervical cancer are over. You know, not so fast. I found out those pesky abnormal cells had migrated to the anus. I was like, I don't have anal sex. What, what the heck is going on? Again, nobody actually explained to me that when you have HPV, the whole genital area is susceptible to numerous cancers. And so you constantly have to be screened. I realized the more I worried, the faster these abnormal cells seemed to multiply. I worried they multiplied. And of course, they were increasing my chances of cancer. And treatment was by a procedure called electro electrocautery. That's a procedure I undergo every six months, or I did for the last three years. And the healing process was excruciating. And I'll stop there for a minute. Thank you. Thank you, Nesita. So we'll move to question two, and we'll start with PJ. PJ, can you talk about the process of working through the healthcare system, please? Sure. Today, patients are their own care coordinators. 
They're responsible for the reporting of their family histories, background on their own medical treatment, including things like colonoscopies, diabetes, scheduling yearly screenings. It is incumbent upon the patient to ensure that the doctor is informed about their health information and to guarantee that their electronic health record contains all the current information that is critical to their proper care. Of course, it is still incumbent upon the individual to make all the doctor appointments, including routine care, specialty care, lab work, screenings and assessments, colonoscopies included. It is difficult to rely upon case managers to do that for you. And one sign of successfully living with HIV is to do your own care coordination. I remember in 1994, I had reason to go to a dentist to get dental care. I walked into the clinic I was met with a doctor that had two masks, two pairs of gloves, a face shield, and two gowns. The doctor was not allowed to touch anything in the exam room. If he needed something, he had to call in a nursing assistant to get it for him. That was my first reality, smack in the face, if you will, of what it was like living with HIV. It continued that way for the next three to four years. I can say happily today that is not the case. I go see a regular dentist. I take all my medication as prescribed. The dinner, dentist and I have good working conditions and working relationship. It is difficult to rely upon case managers for coordinating your care because they are so inundated with patients with clients that have their needs need to be met. So I took it upon myself to learn as much as I could about HIV, to learn as much as I could about my own self-care and to start practicing it. I found that I was able to make my own self-referrals for routine care with my case manager, with my physician, with my dentist, with a proctologist if I needed to have a colonoscopy done. So. I have been successful in managing my own care and attribute much of that to my research and my willingness to step up and take control. Thank you, PJ. We'll pass it to Nessie Dai. Yes, same question to you. Can you talk about the process of working through the healthcare system? Thank you for repeating it. You're welcome, sorry. <coughs> So I've been most privileged to have access to care and treatment for most of my life living with HIV. Even when I was unemployed, I received care through the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, Medicaid, and even the global program PEPFAR at different times in my life. I say privileged because so many with HIV do not have access to treatment. And having said that, most of my life I had great providers, really, especially in years gone by where doctors and nurses, case managers had time to explain what was going on with my body, the changes that were taking place. For example, <coughs> excuse me, for example, how one medication had to be changed because it was putting me, putting me at risk of osteopenia and then another one was changed because it was putting me at risk to diabetes. And then that one was changed. And the current one couldn't be changed because there's nothing else. And so what they have to do, it's putting me at risk of high cholesterol, therefore cardiac disease. And so now we have to look at another medication to deal with that condition. So, um, but still, I'm grateful that I do have access. At other times, accessing care was frustrating. I had been needing a mammogram for a while. And when I say for a while, I'm talking about three years. This was back in 2019. And because there were times in my life I was homeless, so I was moving from place to place. These records had gotten lost. And the clinic insisted, we cannot give you a mammogram until you produce that paperwork. And it took four years, because I just got this mammogram, I think, last year, when I found 
this amazing infectious disease doctor who demanded that the screening must be done immediately. Now, you might wonder why it took so long even after the doctor had demanded this. So what happened was that I was given a number to one of their clinics. It was a big hospital right here in DC. And what happened is that I called that first clinic for an appointment and they said, oops, you're in the wrong place. They gave me a number to the second clinic. And I called them and they said, no, it's not here. It's this clinic. Still in the same, um, in the same um, hospital system. Called the third clinic. And they sent me back to the first one. <laughs> I was so frustrated. I nearly cried. And as you can imagine, you know, at that time I'm thinking, where are the case managers? Where are the social workers? Where are people who are supposed to help me? And now imagine, I'm this educated person, you know, I've, and I have empowered others. I am an empowered woman. I've got all these things going for me, but I just can't do it. It took me all of three years to finally get this mammogram. I finally did get it. Now, you're probably wondering, maybe this happened, you know, in some remote, you know, place, maybe like somewhere in the south or some rural area. No, right here in D.C. And so... Um, it's just, just to let you know that it's interesting. Sometimes we might think that we have what it takes, especially in the big cities, but it, it's very, very difficult with the health system and what it is today because, and, and I'm not blaming providers. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Aging with HIV has led to some very interesting experiences. About nine years ago, after I experienced um, menopause, uh, my current ID doctor offered me, nine years later, offered me hormone therapy, okay? All these years, as I mentioned, I would be asked about my sexual activity, whether I was sexually active, but nothing to do um, um, with, hormone, with menopause or hormone therapy. Um, and I never thought to ask about hormone replacement therapy because I just never thought about it. I mean, you don't. You just don't think about, and nobody mentions menopause because, I don't know, I think it's just, it's never talked about. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, I never thought to ask about um, hormone therapy because I'd read somewhere that hormone replacement therapy might increase my risk of cancer. Now, I don't know whether that's accurate, inaccurate, but you know, I'd read somewhere. So later, I, later after, I, after taking chat GPT for a spin, <laughs> I'm a little, you know, I'm a digital grandma here. I learned that post hysterectomy, Hormone replacement therapy might even reduce my risk of cancers such as breast and colon. Again, I'm not very sure. I have Dr. Hagen's here, and I'll probably ask her later because I can't get a hold of my doctor long enough to ask her a bunch of questions. She only has 20 minutes with me, and she's busy checking other things. So, you know. So, like I said, I need to confirm with my ID doctor, but like, since I have Dr. Hagen's here, I'll probably ask her. And what I was saying is that I hope she will have time to explain to me. But I guess maybe providers didn't know, maybe they didn't know this, or maybe they didn't have the time to educate me and couldn't, so that I could make an informed decision. And so today, providers have such little time to explain treatment options to patients. And I say this again, not through their own fault, as they're often overworked, they're burnt out, and can only spend so much time with you with you. Today, I think your time is really, really limited. And you know, the number of patients just keeps on increasing. And so I am grateful for Google and ChatGPT, which isn't always right. But with additional research, I can get my answers. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Richard, same question. Okay. So I feel like my healthcare peaked at pediatric and adolescence. That um, one, I was just having a conversation that one of my first memories was of um, being greeted by Nurse Kim and that big smile and that swag and like cheering me up for appointments and letting me know that like this place that I have to visit several times a year is gonna be okay. Um, that Doctors and nurses were like my second family. They would ask about my school plans, my summer, um, who I was dating. Um, that 
so that when the health conversations came up, I felt like they had my best interests at heart, that um, we were a team in managing my health care. It was a strong emphasis on learning how to read my own labs so that I was empowered to know what the numbers mean. That when I transitioned to adult care, as I was planning for this, I was trying to think of what eight or nine horror story that I have would be the most impactful to share. But instead, I'm, I'm just gonna talk about some general differences that we as lifetime survivors face when we transition to adult care. That the doctor's office is no longer a safe space. It's like, the say that has said, like that they're concerned with getting you in and out in 15 minutes and not understanding what brought you there, what ails you. Um, sometimes, and in my case, I'm the first doc. I'm the first patient a doctor has seen who has been living with perinatal HIV. At best, they don't know what to do, and they have to get um, second guidance. At worst, they say something offensive that just leaves you shook. Um, I've had to explain to a primary care doctor what my um, CD4 and viral load count mean because they weren't trained to do that. I had to deal with doctors who you have no input or say in your healthcare decisions. They're the doctor and what they say goes and if you don't like it then you can find a different doctor. The, I would say that the experience hasn't been all bad but I find that when I do have a good doctor it's not like pediatrics where they're where they're there 20 plus years, they're gone as soon as a better opportunity opens up. And so the, trans the transition phase is where a lot of lifetime survivors fall through the cracks and we drop out of care. The level of compassion is gone, that the difficulty in now navigating the healthcare system by yourself, going to different doctors, being prescribed one thing, and then learning months later that you shouldn't be on it because it interferes with something else. Um, what has worked to manage all this is being in control, like an appointment where a doctor would say, okay, your kidney function looks bad, we'll see you at, again in three months to retest. Like, no, hold up, okay, what can I do in those three months to make it better? What can I do to avoid? If that doesn't work, what are the next steps on um, managing my health care? That I've learned that I can't leave it up to the doctors to like remind me I have to be in control of keeping up with my appointments and with medicine, with insurance updates and changes. And then finally, I've learned that if I'm not getting the level of care that I deserve from a doctor, to not be afraid to seek care somewhere else. That just having a conversation that I'm willing to go from a place that's 10 minutes down the street to an hour away and searching for better health care. Thank you. Great job. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Nasia Dett, you'll start this one. Question three. Uh, what questions or concerns do you have regarding your population and aging with HIV? Lots. <laughs> Having lived with, with, um, having lived with HIV for 37 years, I have many questions, but I've come to learn that there are few answers. So let me focus on the intersection of HIV and menopause again. Um, and, and I'm here because we have so little information about you know, women and menopause generally. Forget women aging with HIV and menopause, mm -hmm. and so I'll keep on talking about this and hopefully you never know one day we will know more. So I've done some research in this area to improve my own understanding of how menopause and HIV is affecting my body and found that there is as I mentioned limited data <clears throat> suggesting women who are aging with HIV and um, and experiencing menopause they they have unique health needs. There is evidence that comorbidities are higher in people with HIV generally, and especially women aging with HIV. And so my concern is how do we tailor treatment for this subpopulation if we don't fully understand their needs? How do we do that? You all are the providers. Hopefully we'll get some answers today. 
Um, <coughs> also, I've been, as I mentioned earlier, I've been diagnosed with osteopenia. And I've been told that I'm at risk of heart disease and diabetes. And I only came to understand these issues when I did my own research and understanding now how menopause is affecting me. I mean, I didn't worry about these things before. It was just, it was for older people. I wasn't yet older. So the limited research on how menopause is affecting us is a major concern. And I say that because really, unless we understand, and, and I know we talk about data and evidence, unless we have a better understanding, w we can't do a very good job. I think we heard from the data that um, Nicole presented the population we are serving is probably over 50 percent, you know, over 50 years old. And a large number of that population, from the data that I've seen, I'm, I'm not sure whether you men mentioned it, you may not have, but, you know, 28, about 28 percent are women, okay? And of that population, a good number of those majority are black women. I'm a black woman here. And so I'm, I'm curious, what are we going to do? That number is going to continue growing. And we just, we, we need more information. This morning we had a session um, that we had with um, Dr. Cheever. And someone asked um, what was going on with this population. And, um, and I know Richard is going to talk a little bit more about that, so I will not steal his thunder. But what I was going to say, go back to menopause, I decided to throw in the question of menopause. And Dr. Cheever said, well, we know there is no research. There is hardly any research in that area. And so I think we all know, even as I, as, as, as I bring it up, I think it's evident that we don't have adequate research. And the little, um, the little research we have is really not adequate to enable us to tailor care to this population. Now, we heard, again, earlier that um, our organs, as people living with HIV, uh, are about 10 years, we age about 10 years faster than people without HIV. And so right now, I'm 64, but who knows, maybe I'm 74. You know, my organs are 74 years old. I think about that, and I'm like, gosh, I may only have just another 10 years to live. But <coughs> um, uh, I worry about um, um, the onset of cognitive issues especially. And I say that because, you know, you could tell me your name and five minutes later, I cannot even remember that name. So, um, and, and maybe sometimes it's like, who knows, self-stigma. Just because you think this is what's happening, you assume that's what's going on, and not other things. But um, I do worry about that, and I remind myself, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll die one day, so I need not keep on worrying about we're all going to die. And I'll, I'll repeat again that I'm most grateful for the HIV uh, medication. But again, it was mentioned, I'm not sure if it was Nicole or Dr. Higgins. As good as these medications are, they actually contribute to those comorbidities. And that's why I had to change my medication one, two, three times. And, um, and I know Dr. Higgins mentioned that our system sometimes may, maybe the, the, the status of being on all the time, maybe slowed down by drugs. But I, I just want you to imagine a scenario where you have a cold or a flu, and it'll never go away. And so in a way, that's how our bodies are working, always on, always, always working. And so um, uh, I, I want to maybe end by saying that it's just going to be so important to get more research so that we know more, so that you know more and so that treatment can be tailored for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I see that those are great points. I appreciate you calling out those gaps too. Um, we will turn it now to Richard. So same question. What questions or concerns do you have regarding your population and aging with HIV? So my biggest concern with aging and lifetime survivors is research. Um, particularly for me, it's research about life expectancy. So that in the presentation earlier, that it starts with, if you're 20, then this happens. But I'm not starting at 20, I'm starting from zero. So does that mean that I live 50 years or does that mean I live 75? Like, my retirement account wants to know, like, do I just <laughs> <laughs> give up as a YOLO or what? Um, but I've asked, um, doctors these questions and the answer is they say we don't know um, 
we have to do more research. The research isn't there. But meanwhile, that this is a relevant question because Mary Bowman only lived to see 30. Hadia Broadbent died at 39. And that we're seeing our advocates and our leaders of our population passing. And like these questions need to be addressed. And it would be one thing if just research isn't being done, but as lifetime survivors, we face barriers to participate in research. I um, signed up to participate in a study at NIH that had the requirements as you must be over, teen, must be over 18, must be undetectable, and must be able to read and write English. So signed up, did my virtual intake, submitted all my health information, and got to the scheduling point. Um, Schedule the first visit, and then I get a follow-up email that um, they overlooked the fact that I was born with HIV and that it has a different impact on my immune system than if it was acquired later in life. This makes, your, this makes it a more unique and rare disease, thus making you ineligible to participate. So I was disappointed to not be able to participate, but it hurt more that like we were never considered to begin with. That it's because of research that I um, discovered that I had a heart valve prolapse that in the beginning of the study, um, nothing was detected, but over the course of the 10 year study that they were following us, um, this was discovered, and now every year since then, I meet with a cardiologist to monitor it, and I wonder that if, like, this, if this was never discovered, when would I have found out when I'm having heart issues and in an emergency room? Um, and that, going to that, the, I'm in a room full of the next closest person to me is, like, double my age, and I'm explaining to the doctors that, like, HIV and aging causes um, us to age faster and we're experiencing symptoms that um, older adults see but we're not taken as seriously because we're young. And that age, the research into um, aging with HIV isn't just beneficial for lifetime survivors, it'll give us a better overlook of the whole aging process so that we can know and help anyone with relevant data we find. Great points, thank you so much Richard. Okay, we'll turn it to PJ now. Same question. What questions or concerns do you have regarding your population and aging with HIV? There are no national standards for the treatment of those of us aging with HIV. None. They don't exist. We're in the process of trying to write standards of care for the aging with HIV in Baltimore because we recognize that it is necessary. It is critical to the care and treatment of those of us who are aging. There should be ongoing mental health assessments at each visit, physical exams including gait and other tests, involve case managers and navigators in enhancing care coordination. Pharmacists should review medications and educate patients about side effects, cognitive and balance changes, impact functioning and quality of life, Physicians should follow the five M's geriatric principles focusing on geriatric syndromes. Among those are mind, including dementia, depression, and early detection of cognitive impairment, which can help patients plan. Treating depression can help improve physical, social, and cognitive functioning. Mobility, gait, balance, activity level, fall risk, and exercise. This includes the assessment of frailty to in identify interventions to maintain mobility, assess history of falls, home safety, safety issues, and frisks for falls can prevent injury and maintain mobility. Then there's multimorbidity, management of multiple chronic conditions and treatment of comorbidities to maintain health and quality of life. Medications, polypharmacy. I have been on 23 different medications. 23 times my medications have been changed since 1993. That's an enormous amount of change. Yet I managed to work my way through it. Polypharmacy and drug-drug interactions, including review of medications to prevent drug-drug interactions, 
optimize prescribing, eliminating the unnecessary or side effect inducing meds, assess pain and evaluate available medications for pain management, and what matters most. That is the absolute underscore everything else. Identify a person's medical, social priorities, and sexual health issues. Until we incorporate the geriatric principles of care into the routine practice of care for people aging and living with HIV, we will be continue to challenge in their care and treatment. Thank you, PJ. We'll turn it to Richard now. Question four, what would you like providers to know? Sure, I would like providers to know that it's important to understand the person in front of you. That for lifetime survivors, that understanding that for us this disease represents trauma in many different ways from dealing with being reminded of the loss of a parent or um, being in foster care or being raised by a different guardian because your birth parent wasn't able. That before we are seeking our first relationships we're dealing with the navigation of disclosure, criminalization laws, and stigma. That in many forms, trauma shows up in our care, and that for the support systems that are there that help us, there's, they don't work if you gotta wait three months for a mental health appointment, or you need housing assistance and you can't get it, or cuts are being made to Ryan White or other support services you need. That, um, secondly, it was that the intersectionality between being a life si lifetime survivor and a heterosexual male, that especially in um, adult care is lacking, that I've, before I met the lifetime survivors after searching for support groups or organizations that were there to assist, there was none. Like, I often describe the experience as being um, ostracized from an ostracized community. Um, that I remember back in the days of camps where um, the gender makeup was 50-50 and now with the lifetime survivors that it's 80-20 um, um, female and like we're missing males as they fall through the cracks and that of the three lifetime survivor males that I know who passed away, I would attribute um, that's a stigma. That, um, and finally, or I think that we need to do a better job of documenting and tracking care for lifetime survivors that when we turn 18, our health statistics get blended in with the general population so that if you're looking at data on a 30-year-old, you don't know if they've been living with HIV for three years, 10 years, or 30 years, and that makes a big difference when you're talking about resistance, when you're talking about comorbidities, that um, accelerated aging, and that tracking is especially important for, as lifetime survivors, we represent those who um, are born with HIV, but also those who acquired HIV through early childhood. So we're talking about um, people who acquire HIV through blood transfusions, maybe in the first weeks or even first days of their lives. But instead of being counted as perinatal, they get lumped into others' transmissions. And that as a population that is often left out, we gotta recognize, especially at a Ryan White conference, that blood transfusion lifetime survivors are here and that they're um, not getting care that um, they're not getting represented in the data. Thank you, Richard. Okay, PJ, what would you like providers to know? I'd like providers to know that we are partners in our health care. We're not there to listen to doctors dictate to us what will be done. We are to be consulted. We are to be informed. We are to be participatory fully in our own health care. The second thing I want people to understand and providers to know is that there are many of us who have gone for years dealing with this disease. And it is incumbent upon them to treat us with respect, with dignity, and to do everything within your power to ensure that those of us who are not getting proper care or insufficient care receive the proper and sufficient care. 
the highest level of new infections just releases information is among the Latinx population, especially men who have sex with men. That's critical. And yet there is little to no provision of care to that population. There's little to no outreach and prevention to that population. They almost don't exist. Like Richard has said about living lifetime with HIV. The population was essentially ignored. It was predominantly inhabited originally with gay white men. But all along it has been African American women. All along it has been lifetime survivors. All along it has been people who have Hispanic and Latinx origin. It is critical. I want to go ahead and leave people with a few resources. One is myhivteam.com. If you have anybody that is HIV positive in your life and they're struggling with dealing with HIV, refer them to that site. It is comprised of people who are long-term survivors, lifetime survivors, and the newly diagnosed to get answers to questions or to have support for anything that you have that's bothering you. The second one is the reunionproject.net. The Reunion Project is comprised predominantly of long-term survivors. They hold weekly, excuse me, they hold quarterly town hall meetings in various cities around the country. They just recently had one in Baltimore in February, and they just finished one in, in Denver, I believe, is going to occur next weekend. The last is MyDirectives.com. Through all this, we have to ensure that we do long-term care planning. It's good to have a long-term care plan. It's good to have directives in place. It's simple, secure, and always free. Thank you for those resources, PJ. Um, yeah, you can pause. Uh, Nasiadet, we'll uh, move on to you. What would you like providers to know? Thank you. Um, just briefly, I think as I responded to my questions, I kept on peppering with the issues that I was encountering. So you probably know quite a number of those. So mine will be fairly short. I, I understand providers are busy, but see if you can identify someone, even if it's a peer educator, with this information that they can begin to share. And again, I'll focus on women and menopause. I know, Richard, you, s you talked about a group that was ignored, but even in women experiencing menopause, I don't think there's very much going on with that group of people. So that's another one. Please always include it. And um, so if you could, you know, um, explain to women, you know, what might be going on. Um, well, let's even say the older population. Have someone who can talk about, you know, the, like the, the, um, the intersection with comorbidities such as cardiac uh, disease, such as cognitive issues, such as um, um, diabetes, hypertension. I think that would be good. You begin preparing people um, that you are, or patients that you are treating. So that would be very helpful. And um, the idea, I know there are some health facilities which have everything under one roof. That is so helpful in terms of navigating the system. And then um, I think compassion. I think that was mentioned already. But compassion, we still need compassion. And I say that because um, sometimes the, the kind of care, I think even Richard might, may have mentioned how he was treated. Now there's something that I find very interesting and this is probably my last point. And I have noticed this in my work as well, is that there's some providers who don't want to treat people with HIV. And you know, I'm, I, I was, at first I was like, what, what is going on? What haven't we done? And then I had my own little experience right here in DC when I went for dental cleaning and the dentist didn't want to treat me. And it didn't come out right that it's because I was HIV. But I tried to make an appointment and it was a no, no, no. Can I make an appointment next week? No. The next month, no. So basically there was no time I could make an appointment. And um, sometimes it feels really um, like you don't want to disclose that you're HIV because this is, this is stigma today in a big city and you just wonder what is going on. So um, when I say I cringe when I hear that, and I know it happens a lot. My, some of my recipients have told me it happens a lot in the South. 
um, where they cannot even get providers. And so I guess my question is, what more do we need to do? Are we educating people adequately? Something needs to be done for sure. And so <coughs> um, sometimes when I go through such experiences, this is where I want to go to that little place of ignorance is bliss. Let me just forget about HIV for just a little while. And I'll tell you, uh, my two children, who are now 37 and 39 years old, they've been instrumental in keeping me alive because sometimes I get so frustrated, I'm like, what in the world? I just, I just really get upset. And they gave me purpose for a very long time to live. And then after they grew up, and I was like, so what am I still doing in this world? They've grown up. They encouraged me to live a life without fear of dying by helping others who are struggling with HIV. And so um, as, as you do the work that you're doing, um, the people you call peer educators, those who are HIV positive and who can help others by sharing their experience, those become very critical. And I say that because I know a number of, um, a number of my recipients have a huge problem with, with, with their CAP, with their community boards, advisory boards. And that's where we bring in those who are living with HIV, those who are walking the walk and can be able to help others with their, by sharing their experience. Thank you so much. Okay, so on to our last question. I am going to ask the panelists if we could do maybe one or two sentences. Um, we recognize that this is very important, but we also want to be mindful of time. Um, so uh, PJ, we'll start with you. What matters most? What matters most? I am here after 40 years of being positive because I got involved in something bigger than myself. It was very simple. I went and joined the PWA coalition in Baltimore when it was still in existence. And from there, I moved on to the planning council. 25 years ago, I was chair of the Baltimore planning council. I am now doing my second stint as chair of the planning council. And I can say that those 25 years have meant the world to me. They have kept me going. They have kept me motivated. They have kept me involved. So that would be my advice to anybody that is HIV positive or anyone that you come across that is HIV positive. Get them to get involved in something bigger than themselves. Thank you so much. Nice to that. Same question, what matters most in like one or two sentences? I will echo what um, Richard has said. Um, really, it's about service. Help others, use your experience and help others overcome these struggles. It is huge, living with HIV, especially at the beginning, until you get to that age where you can just, you know, take it lightly because it is what it is, and you have to keep um, living, so it's sort of like a coping mechanism. But, you know, um, be, be out, put yourself out there and help others. And then as for the providers, I said before, listen and try and educate your parents, your patients, so that they know what's going on with their body, with their medication. And I know you don't have time, but try your best. Thank you. And finally, Richard, what matters most? What matters most for lifetime survivors is being included at the table, whether that's in policy discussions, research, or treatment protocols that for the longest we've been forgotten about. Like I will say at this conference, it has touched my heart to go to different panels and hear people ask questions at the end, well, what about lifetime survivors? And it's just like, it's good to be remembered and included. And we just got recognized as a population that's aging with HIV. And yet like the oldest member of our group is 42 and that they're still eight, years away from getting HIV and aging services so that we need to, how we look at HIV is not just the age that you are, but also the age that you have been living with HIV. Um, that, and the last point that I want to make is that as I was having the discussion um, in one of the sessions earlier, I just realized that the first person to get to 80 years living with HIV, if God forbid there's not a cure before then, um, will probably be a lifetime survivor that we are the future of aging with HIV, but we're also a part of the present. Thank you so much. Yes, let's please give a, a wonderful applause to our panelists. Thank you all for your time. I am going to turn it over to Kat now so she can facilitate some Q&A.
Thank you very much. We have some time. Um, thank you very much to the panelists and to Nicole and Dr. Hagens for your presentations. I do believe we have one question from the chat room. Melissa? Yes, we do. One question is, what is your advice on how to best motivate, engage prenatally infected patients who are now in their 20s, 30s, and seem to simply just be tired of all the medications and tired of ongoing doctor's appointments? We'll pass that to you, Richard. Yeah, I guess that's <laughs> right to me, huh? Yeah, that's you. <laughs> um, I would say that for the longest time, it felt like I had no choice, that I was told that I have to take this medicine. Um, that's it, like, no, um, no option. And that it wasn't until I got older that, and seeing some of the people pass away from choosing not to take medicine, which I understand you've been on medicine your whole lives, you're tired, you want a break, but that by taking these medicine, I'm choosing to stay healthy and fight for another day where there's one day um, the injectable might be every six months or a year or, or cure, but like doing what I have to today to keep me alive for tomorrow for the better options. And at the same time, like we need to empower lifetime survivors um, through mental health or through community. Like we have um, our check uh, and support services where I've learned so much that to just be connected and to um, share when I'm having down, having people who understands to lift you back up. So community and hope is what's needed to, for lifetime survivors. Thank you. We have a question from the room. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. Very important. Each one. The, the menopause and women with that HIV menopause, you forget everything. I don't remember your names anymore. <laughs> so if I ask you what your name is. But thank you. From the Planning Council point of view, what do you need from us? What should we as planning councils be doing to ensure that what you need is being addressed at our level? Put pressure on the federal government. There used to be a time when the Ryan White Care Act ensured that 5% of the funds that were awarded to EMAs went to planning council support. 5% went to the recipient or the grantee. It is no longer the case. We just received a cut of $30,000 from last year because our funding was cut in the award. We have barely enough money to hold meetings, to bring people together, to talk with each other, to, na to navigate with each other. That is my think, I think the most critical put pressure on the federal government to ensure that we have sufficient funding. Okay, we have another question from the chat. Yes, what are the most pressing issues you would like your provider to discuss with you? So I, we'll pass that to Nasaydek. You know I'm just gonna talk about menopause. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Okay, Do it. Let, let, let me be fair. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do, um, as you age, <coughs> even without HIV, when you, when you age, there are those um, diseases that come as a result of aging. You know, you have your cardiovascular disease. You, as a woman, you know, as you reach menopause, you begin having bone uh, loss density. Mm -hmm. um, you begin having, um, you know, your hormone, there's hormone decline, right? And that impacts other, other it impacts you, you know, you have hot flashes, you have all these other symptoms. And I imagine for men as well, there are um, those, um, the diseases also that affect them like hypertension and diabetes and you name it, there's a host of, whole host of them. But for people aging with HIV, they're a little bit more intense and, and this is why we need more research. And then for women, even more intense who are aging with HIV, so more research. So, so what, do you, what is it that we need? I think it's just important to educate. Um, as you are working with the clients, we have already seen that the aging population is increasing. 
prepare them. You know, let them know these diseases are coming. And I know you've been telling them, you know, eat healthy, exercise, do this, do that. It's just important, even if they're not able to do some of those things. For example, they li live in a food desert. They hardly have enough money. But it's just important for them to know. You know, offer them hormone therapy. I think through Ryan White, they can be offered for, for women who, who have mm -hmm. reached menopause. Menopause um, hormone therapy is an option. And so, um, you know, just, just prepare them, I think. Educate them, you know. And, um, and with women, again, I found out that so often they're referred to obstetric and gynecology, and then there's no follow through. You don't know what happens. It just, yeah, we referred them there. And, uh, and then sometimes I ask, and so what happened? And I get this blank look. So follow through, see what's going on. Okay, we have time, thank you. One more question from the room. Oh, oh, tough. Maybe two questions, I'll be nice. As long as they're quick, easy questions. <laughs> Um, what would be an advice that you would give to someone that's between the age of 30 and 40 living with HIV but has been affected with other diseases um, like r renal failure? I, I know that sometimes, you know, I, I guess the question is, how would you give hope to those people? <clears throat> Not so, an easy question. Right, yeah. It's, it's tough dealing with like HIV and other comorbidities that um, my biggest advice would be again, um, community, join our group that we have these discussions all the time about I have HIV but I was born with these um, speech issues or mobility issues or I'm going through this diagnosis or I got diagnosed with cancer in addition to HIV and it's like we recognize that this is the circumstances that we have to deal with but we also like send support to each other let us know that we're loved that let's know that like there's maybe still things that bring you um, joy that um, having someone to talk to who just gets you, who you feel seen, who you feel heard, that that can help a bit. It's the medical um, perspective is hard, um, but knowing that like you're not alone helps a lot. Last question. I would join myhivteam.com. It is comprised of literally thousands of people who are living with HIV. And if we can't sufficiently answer your question, if you pose it to the group, I'm sure you will find many, many responses. Okay, I'll try to make this quick. Um, I was um, I'm a social worker. I worked 24 years in pediatric HIV. And what you described is what I feared in terms of they laid us off and then they the, the patients were concerned about going into the adult program with the lack of support. The question is, um, I have pe oh, some um, lifetime survivors and they're, and they're very isolated and they, dating is just a really hard thing. Do you, are you connected with a national support system or is there some place I can refer them to? Yes. Other than you. <laughs> <laughs> we are a national network. Um, we meet virtually. We, um, we have um, support groups um, weekly. We have a chat where you can instantly connect with us. Um, there's also um, other groups. There's the Dandelions Movement. Um, there's the Peers United group. But um, that in terms of, yes. Yes, connect with us afterwards and we can give you access to a flyer that has all of our information and um, resources. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, I think that's gonna wrap it up. We, we, I think our okay. panelists might stay for a couple minutes afterwards to answer some questions, okay. but we do need to wrap. Okay. There you go. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. Right.
concept of ideal aging and screening, et cetera. And I think it should be done in self Okay, thank, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. So if you are, oh, it went away. Um, there was a slide on there. If you're looking to get continuing ed, please make sure you go on there and complete the information. I want to say thank you again to our panelists and our speakers. This was an One extremely more round of fun. For them. Hmm? One more round of applause. Yes, for this them. was a, an amazingly fun uh, presentation to put together. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all.